the platform that I'm using for teaching and then um, discuss a couple of uh, ways to conduct retrieval practice, which reinforces the information that we want students to get away from the, um, or to take away from the, um, the, the, the learning. Uh, and if this works, uh, can everyone see? Okay, great. Um, so this is just, you know, this is, there's a lot of information here and it's not necessary to get into all of it, but the backward design model is something that came up, you know, maybe about a decade or 15 years ago. Um, and there's an entire book on it, which is definitely worth reading. But just for our purposes, um, what I tend to do, um, and I've been doing this for a number of years, is to construct a course using the learning goals and objectives as the determinant to decide how I'm going to create my instructional strategy and then plan activities and assessments accordingly. And so the idea is really, you know, what do I want students to get, you know, from this course and how am I going to go about making sure that they actually take that information away. Um, and so I'll use the example of the course that I was teaching in the spring, which was taught um, synchronously over Zoom. However, much of the work was conducted asynchronously on the platform through Zoom, which I'll talk about in just a bit. And this course was Islamic art in a global context from 1600 to 1800. So it covers the global Baroque period. Um, there's a lot going on in the world at this time, of course, a lot of theoretical material to cover for the students and also a lot of content in terms of art uh, ideas and issues. And one of the things that I had realized as, you know, in my decade of teaching here now uh, is that reading comprehension of scholarly sources at a junior level uh, is difficult for students sometimes. And so that was one of the learning outcomes I wanted to focus on, you know, to enhance their reading comprehension. For instructional strategy to achieve this, I decided to use the flipped classroom. The students were reading materials uh, on perusal and watching some short videos before class. And then in terms of assignments, the perusal work, of course, counted toward their grades. But in class, I implemented low stakes retrieval practice exercises to both help them remember and then also to reinforce the material that they were learning. Um, Perusal might seem an odd choice uh, for those who are not in the humanities, but I want to say that, you know, this is applicable, this platform is applicable, you know, across different um, disciplines. It was de developed in collaboration by a physics professor at Harvard, uh, and so he primarily used it for his physics classes. So, of course, it works, you know, outside of the humanities and the STEM fields as well. Um, and what it does is convert the traditional sort of isolation, you know, reading experience uh, that students have into something that's much more collective. So if you're, you know, trying to parse a text like Foucault, sitting at home on your own and trying to figure out all the terms in there and all the passages, you know, you might end up with no hair at the end, you know, just pulling it all out. However, in this situation, you're working with all your other classmates and the instructor asynchronously to make sense of the text. And you're doing this before you actually get to the classroom. This way, students come to the class, they're prepared, um, they're actually more confident because they feel comfortable with the knowledge they have, and they also feel comfortable with the fact that there are others who don't know the same things that they don't know, and they're more ready to engage in the classroom. And finally, for instructors, this really is helpful uh, that Perusal has what's, uh, essentially an AI um, algorithm that's guiding grading. I'll tell you that I don't use it extensively. I use it as kind of like, you know, a basic measure uh, to make sure that students have completed, you know, the work to the degree that I want them to. But in terms of quality, I myself go in and look at what they've done and then assess their, their annotations and comments um, accordingly. So this is what, uh, this is a screenshot of one of my perusal uh, courses, and this is what it looks like. Gives you a lot of information. There's lots of different ways that you can construct it and engage with it. But I just wanted to draw your attention to the information on the right side. And you can see that it gives you uh, a little um, diagram uh, to see you know, how many students have been able to complete the assessment or the assignment. 
uh, how many have not been able to you know, put in any work. It gives you a sense of the average reading time for this particular reading for the students. Um, and lots of other information, you know, that you might find useful when it comes to discussing uh, the content in the classroom. Um, it also gives you a confusion report and generates about two or three main points that students or many students have found confusing. And then other kinds of analytics to help you, again, drive the conversation in the discussion uh, in, in, in the classroom. So I take the material from the perusal and then take it back to the classroom and bring it into the classroom and have live discussion with the students. And I'm able to point to, well, you know, um, student X was able to uh, provide us with greater understanding of this concept. Uh, and student Y had this amazing question and it all sort of ties together. And then they're able to contribute as well in the classroom situation. So here's a, an example of how this works. This is a text that they were supposed to read on the Global Baroque. This is looking at Russia's engagement with the world. And a student put in a comment here on in the chat box. This chat box works just like social media does pretty much. Um, and here is my response to the student. And I can use you know, all sorts of different creative ways, you know, put in links, um, use emojis to respond to what they've said. And so they're getting kind of, you know, it's not real time, but they're getting this asynchronous feedback on the document itself that they're supposed to be reading from their instructors and then engaging with their um, classmates um, as well. And here's another example where three different students are conversing with each other about a particular section of the reading. And then I'm offering encouragement to them because they've done a really good job of um, going through that material together. So when we take this back to the classroom, um, I you know, have regular discussions. The students are moderating some of the discussions back in the classroom too. But I also believe in using retrieval practice because I think it really helps them engage more actively rather than just sort of passively sitting there and listening to what other students are saying or I'm saying. And um, there are three good reasons to use retrieval practice. I'm sure you can find others as well. But most of the, the material that they're gaining you know, knowledge about from the readings is going into their short-term memory. And so if they're discussing it in class, if they're applying that information to real world problems or solving you know, um, philosophical issues, uh, by doing all of that in the classroom through these practices, they're storing that information into their long-term memory. And that really sort of helps you know, transfer knowledge and skills from one class to another or from one year to another or from school you know, out into uh, the lived experience. Um, these retrieval practices, of course, have to be low stakes. You don't want to overwhelm them with too much, you know, um, hardcore sort of assignments uh, with higher percentage values. Um, and then I usually use about two or three um, per, per class. Um, so the tools that I use for retrieval practice include the discussion board where they do short responses, um, Mentimeter, poll everywhere, word clouds. Uh, and then sometimes there are breakout groups that I might uh, conduct in the classroom. And the kinds of activities that I use for retrieval practice include brain dumps, where you're writing down whatever you remember from the reading or lecture, five words that come to mind from the topic, flash forwards, what is one thing that you really want to take away from this and remember five years down the road, and think, pair, share, uh, where you ask a question, let students think about it, and then ask them to share the information with the peer. So here's just an example of using a word cloud. They had done work uh, reading and discussion on the Mughals and their worldview during uh, the uh, global Baroque period. And they were able to pull this terminology sort of together uh, from their reading and then uh, create a, a word cloud. And you can see, of course, the word power um, is the largest one and at the center. Uh, which featured quite prominently in their reading and their discussions. And finally, what did students think about this? Uh, they seemed to be, you know, mostly uh, positive in their thinking. Uh, they thought the experience was really useful. Uh, some of them said their course, the course stimulated their critical thinking, analytical and writing skills. Uh, they found perusal challenging, but also enriching. Um, they 
thought that the course was more about quality rather than quantity, which was really gratifying to hear. Um, they liked that it was not completely lecture based, uh, that there was more interaction between the students and the professors. And what was really also very uh, rewarding for me was the fact that they were able to take these methods and then apply them to other courses and enhance their understanding. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Zalal. Sorry, give me a moment. I'm trying to juggle like four things at a time and two monitors actually is not helping. I would uh, like to now um, introduce Dr. Iyad Massad, who is the Zachary Professor in the Mechanical Engineering Department at Texas A&M University at Qatar, um, as well as the Executive Director for Global Partnerships at the Texas A&M Engineering Experiment Station. Uh, Dr. Massad, the floor is yours. Thank you, Khadija, um, for organizing uh, this forum. Um, you all see my screen? All right, so as Khadija said, I teach here in the mechanical engineering program at uh, Texas a and at Qatar. And uh, I teach in the area of materials and mechanics. For those of you who are not familiar with this area, this is the most exciting area to teach in, especially for students. Um, so uh, when all this started, I wanted to tell you about the challenges that um, I started with when the COVID and going online in teaching. I think the biggest challenge for teaching was me. Uh, I realized quickly that I'm the biggest obstacle that students have for online teaching because I'm not familiar or trained for delivery in online or remote teaching. I teach by, uh, I, I believe in the energy during teaching. I believe in engagement with the students. So I faced this challenge that my motivation dropped significantly myself initially. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about how effective our assessment methods are. There were a lot of discussion whether we are assessing students fairly now online, are students being so honest in taking exams, so on and so forth. So that was a concern for me because the big the, the delivery of teaching and accepting what we teach or what the education is really based on trust between students and faculty members. So you don't want to break that bridge. And then I start asking myself, um, how do I change my teaching style? which relies on bringing physical models to class, group work in the class, so on and so forth. And I was very concerned when all this started with my limited interactions with the students. Of course, it doesn't help that we cannot ask students to turn on their cameras. It is what it is. You can't ask them. So I have to stare at many black boxes, sometimes without even cool pictures on their screen and pretend that I'm engaged with these black boxes. So it was really challenging for me personally. And then I started thinking about if it's so challenging for me as an adult and a professor who's experienced, who's been teaching for many years, how would it be for students? So no matter what I feel about it, no matter how disengaged I can be, I owe it ethically, professionally to students to find ways to deliver and to adhere to the quality. So I have to find ways to, to deliver the course content. Uh, and I sought help. This was recommended to me by CTL and by my program chair, which is a course that I uh, went through in the summer from the Association of College and University Educators. I highly recommend it. I did not go through the full certification. It will require many of these courses. But this course about online delivery that I found it to be useful, very useful. And it was nice to find, um, to basically learn how to be engaged in online and remote teaching. So I can do it properly in the fall semester following the summer. So I took this course and several of us did from Tamu Q, and they found it useful in several ways that I will tell you about it now. So one thing I learned is um, 
and I implemented is giving students from day one, which I spend good time in the summer preparing a complete master plan. I called it master plan. ACUE called it roadmap for the entire semester from day one till the end. Each week, what we're doing, what videos they are required to see, what lecture, a short micro lectures they need to watch before they come to class, what questions they need to ask. It was mapped from day one till the end. I found that students appreciated it a lot. I did. It gave me a roadmap to follow. And sometimes I had an urge to make changes and I did not. I just convinced myself any change I want to make, I'll make next semester, not this semester. I just minimized the, um, the amount of change to minimize the confusion for students. Now, um, one of the recommendations is to prepare these short lectures that do not exceed five minutes, 10 minutes about the topic. Believe it or not, actually, I did not record any of these lectures. I found amazing lectures on my courses done professionally, either by certain organizations. And in this case, this course I taught in the fall was by a colleague at TAMU in my own main campus that I did not need to reinvent the wheel. So this is another lesson. There are so many great resources that one can use for lectures, especially in technical topics. Maybe in liberal arts, it will be hard to adopt it. But for us, uh, the physics is the same. The content is the same. So I found these short lectures that I put for students and helped a lot. And the publisher had, instead of using the physical models that I used to prepare for students and bring to class, I, I, when I sought help and looked for it, I found help. So then the first lesson that I don't have to make everything myself. A lot of these resources are available. I just have to find them and put them for the students and replace my physical models of material microstructure, for example, with videos and animation. Um, then I mentioned to you about the issues, concern about the assessment. Um, typically, I would have maybe 30 to 40% of my class based on two midterms and a final exam. I got rid of all this. Um, my grading became more on engagement, on preparing outlines, on writing reflections. And these, by the way, these reflections are not, um, are not writing. These were preparing videos reflecting on the lecture. So each student has to prepare five minute video bi-weekly reflecting on what we learned. And they were very creative, the students. They were looked for resources. They looked for other videos they can present and they looked for applications of the materials that we teach. So you can see heavy part of the grading went to them. When I did the assessment, instead of doing two major exams, which I believe it puts a lot of pressure on students in terms of seeking um, other means of, <laughs> of, of uh, scoring on the exam, these weekly assessments, I really did not find a major issues with uh, cheating and when I went to the weekly uh, or short assessments. Um, and then the project. So you can see I went from maybe 50 to 60% based on two or three exams to short assignments and short reflections and variety. Writing is one, which is the outline, preparing videos, and students enjoy that they have variety of ways of reflecting and engaging with the course. So the main lessons. I think one has to be very considerate of students' own challenges without compromising standards. It's a fine line between being considerate for what they are going through by, I mean, these students all of a sudden, they went away from campus for two years. They were dreaming of being engaged with their students, college life, being part of a group, cohort. And now they have to sit home and also listen to us for hours a day several hours a day. It's, it's very challenging. I think best years, best days of their experience, uh, of their life experience, college experience, they could not achieve. So we have to be considerate without compromising on the standards. There is not a single way to ensure a quality of education. I have to convince myself that maybe there are a lot of things to learn and take away late. I'm implementing now. And then um, seek help, look for resources and share your experiences. 
CTL at TAMUQ had internal forums that were very helpful to learn from my other colleagues on how they do things. And also to, to know that you are part of a community and you are not the only one who's going through these challenges, others do. It was very helpful, these activities. I found them uh, to be helpful, like this forum we are in right now. Just helpful to know, to learn from others. I think positive attitude is so important. It doesn't help to complain about things and say, well, there's uh, cheating, there is this going on, I, teaching online is this and that. It is what it is. I mean, it's reality. We all have to do it. So be a positive force, engage, and I think it will, you will find solution. Um, because we have the same, the different means to achieve the same goal. So just being a negative energy in the system, it just doesn't help anybody. It doesn't help the teacher, it doesn't help the student, it doesn't help the institution. So engage, I think that is would be uh, helpful. That's just, I want to share with you some of my thoughts and uh, uh, thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Masad. Um, I would now like to invite uh, Dr. Patrick Walsh who is an assistant teaching professor of philosophy at CMU Qatar, where he teaches ethics and social philosophy to business and science students. Dr. Walsh, the floor is yours. And folks, if you have any questions, please start dropping them in the chat because we can get to those first even um, after Dr. Walsh is done speaking. Thank you so much, Adita. Um, Dr. Massad, I think you might be still sharing. Am I still sharing? Yeah. See, I told you I'm the problem. How about now? <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Hatija, for organizing and introducing me. Um, I'm happy to be here. My takeaway from uh, online teaching is a bit radical. And it's because it sort of when we made that transition, especially that summer after the first initial transition, I really started reconsidering the kind of glue that held courses together, that created final grades, that made me confident in evaluating student work. And this kind of led me to this thing called specifications grading and reconsidering grading systems in general. I like specifications grading. I'm gonna describe it, advocate a bit for it, but really what I wanna encourage is a reconsideration, not of reinventing the wheel, but of reconsidering the wheel and how appropriate it is to our purposes. So some of the challenges, I mean, we all talk about the challenges we face and there's a few of them that I wanna just highlight. Two are dual. In-person assessments didn't work very well online and online assessments don't work all the time in person. Uh, sometimes they just don't work in the same kinds of ways. And so the appropriateness of assessments to our course contexts, to the modes of instruction, to the students we have this year, these are questions that we're constantly faced with and the whole, you know, every week might be different uh, kind of environment we're in that created a lot of questions about whether these assessments really are doing what we want them to do. We also needed a lot of agility and flexibility for well, students needed that, but also us as instructors. And this is why I wanna kind of consider a radical rethinking of how grades and grading systems work. I sort of set myself up for failure because this is a short talk and it's kind of a big topic. Uh, but I'll just kind of give the highlights and I'm happy to answer questions uh, now or later about this fancy thing called specifications grading. Three main features I want to highlight though. The first, assignments are pass fail. So according to some binary rubric, you want a high but achievable level. I don't actually use the language pass fail in my courses. I think it's a little demoralizing and students seem to agree. Uh, but that's at least the fast way to describe it, that there's a threshold beyond which it counts full credit and below which it does not. 
that's a bit high stakes that can create stress. It can also just be a, a bit of a messy signal about whether students actually get it. And so there's opportunities to redo and drop assignments so that students learn from mistakes. That's not my learning objective in my courses, but I think it's like a meta objective to have students who feel comfortable with failure, who look at their past work and try to approve on it. Uh, and that's what specs grading incentivizes by giving these opportunities to redo and to trial and practice things and then do better later. Kind of the most obvious thing that happens in specifications grading or specs grading for short, is that final grades are based on a passing a certain number of specified assignments. It's not a weighted average. It's not points. It's not percentages. It's literally just the number of past assignments. That is assignments that the student passed, not in the past. So discussions of features of the system are one thing. Let's talk about an example of how a final grade may be calculated using just specs, specifications. I use cumulative specs, so this is what it's gonna look like. A D in my course, let's say if I use this table, you have to pass 10 journals. Maybe that's just effort-based. Maybe you have to cite a reference, maybe whatever. Whatever I think passing is, I put it into a very clear specified rubric, and that's what passing is. If they pass 10 journals, they save themselves from an F or in CMU and R, I don't know why. To get a C in my course, you have to do the D-level stuff, pass those 10 journals, and pass two presentations. Maybe there's only two opportunities for presentations. Maybe there's 10 opportunities for presentations. Whatever you want to set it up, in this spec at least it says that to get a C in the course, you only need to pass two of them. Maybe on the second, third try, maybe on the fifth, sixth try. Maybe on the first and second, that'd be great. To get a B in the course, you have to do the D stuff, the C stuff, and pass a paper. And let's say you assume you require them to do some peer review as well. Uh, and an A is just all the previous stuff plus an extra paper, maybe in a mid-semester and an end of the semester paper with peer review for both of them. If you get an A in the course, you have to do all the assessments here at a satisfactory level. And we're thinking high, 80, 85, depending on your context, 90% B, A level stuff. And so if they do this, they've done B or A level work on all or enough of the assessments to convince you that they have mastered the relevant material. Kind of more like a problem set, uh, mathematical or STEM type of class. You might just say, to get a D, you need to attend enough you need to have achieved at least an 80% on half the problem sets. Maybe you need to pass two exams at 85% or higher to get a C on top of the problem sets you've completed for the D. To get a B, you have to not just get 80% on half the problem sets, but on 80% of the problem sets. And the table suggests that an A means you've passed all four exams at a pretty high level, a mid B or higher. So on the one hand, this makes Ds pretty achievable, but it doesn't, you can't get a D by doing D level work. So even a D is meaningful in that they have achieved, have achieved a decent mastery of some of the material, not 60% mastery of a lot of it. On the other side, A means that they've done really pretty well on everything, which is of course how we usually think of A's. The way I think of this uh, for your course and for my course is just kind of basing it on learning objectives. This goes back to the backwards design that Rajal was talking about, that a D means you've achieved a learning objective, maybe one or two. C means you've achieved maybe one more. B means you've achieved even one more. A means you've achieved all my learning objectives at a high but achievable level. And that makes me happy. If you leave my course with an A, that means you've achieved all of my learning objectives. And this to me makes final grades much more meaningful than a weighted average of many assignment point values. Not that there's anything uh, like unjust about that, but it's a little bit of a messy signal whereas specs grading gives us a very clear signal. I know exactly what an A means in terms of the pedagogical outcomes for the student. 
So what does specs work best with? And I want to uh, integrate this into the, the previous two speakers. Backwards design, that's great with specs grading. Backwards design helps you align learning objectives, assessments, and your activities. But how do you put those all together into a grade? Specs grading provides one possible answer that I think is a bit fresh and reconsider some things that I think have no pedagogical value in the way that we traditionally do things. It also allows assessment choice and agency. If you have multiple types of assessments that get to that one learning objective for the CE, let them do any of them. Let students achieve any of those at a certain high level, then you're gonna be confident that they have demonstrated mastery of that learning objective, no matter which of the assessments they've chosen. It works with low stakes and high stakes assessments. Um, you could have, you know, complete 105 journals, you know, for a day. Sure, whatever, like it totally works. The grades are calculated in the same way. If you only have four types of assignments, great, that works fine too. Even if you have one type of assignment, uh, if you have multiple versions of the same assignment, then that also works with specs grading. It doesn't really matter how many assignments you have, specs can work. Hopefully the, the gears are turning in your head and like you're trying to figure out what is this for? Why would you do this? What's the cost and benefit? And I'll actually start with the challenges. So one of the challenges is the LMSs don't handle this very well. They don't automatically calculate the final grades if you do it this way. They're designed, especially like Canvas, is designed for calculating weighted averages where you group assignments into the, you know, the, uh, problem sets are worth 30%, participation 10, that kind of thing. Specs grading doesn't really fit neatly into the, these kinds of boxes. That's a serious challenge. And since we've been relying more on LMSs, maybe this is a deal breaker. Uh, that's fine, that can happen. It's new to you and to students, so it may be confusing for you or students. Uh, and I'll talk about in the last slide, that, but they love it. Students absolutely love it. I've gotten uniform and very specific positive feedback on this system. It's radical. That is a challenge. There's a lovely book called Small Teaching, uh, which says, uh, you know, changes in your instruction that don't have to wait for next semester. You could do them this Monday, for us this Sunday. Uh, this is not one of those. This is not small teaching. This is kind of a big change. You may, I mean, there's just mental and energy and time concerns that would bring a challenge to this. I'm not going to ignore those uh, but I think it's still worth it if you can find the time. The benefits, I think, are broad and really powerfully educational. The first one is that it provides flexibility and control for students. This is particularly great during the pandemic when I first tried this out, is that the way that SPECS is organized is that they know exactly what the A and the B require. And if they just want to pass the course, because I teach a lot of electives, if they, they may even love the course, but if they need that pressure valve because their other courses are just too hard, their family life is difficult, things happen, semesters are crazy. They actually know exactly what they can do to be more confident about how they're going to end the semester. If you need to do the giant paper for the A, but the B doesn't require the giant paper, the student literally doesn't even attempt it. I think I was being honest when I said that's radical, right? You're allowing students to say, I'm not gonna even try that because I'm gonna just be satisfied with the B. But remember, they're not just doing C level work to get a C, they have to do B or A level work to get a C, but only on a subset of assignments. So that flexibility retains the academic rigor that we would like. As I was arguing, I think this creates meaningful final grades. I know what a B means when they get it. It's not that they did A-level work on some things, C-level work on other things, and some weighted average of that created an 84. I know exactly the learning objectives that I believe I've evaluated that they have achieved based on my rubrics and the specs that I've given. And so the final grades become more meaningful to me and probably more importantly to students. They see the connection between the learning objectives and the assessments, and they also understand that they get opportunities to redo those assessments until it's good enough. And that really prioritizes learning for those final grade purposes. 
This one's a bit just from my perspective. Uh, I mean, there's a book written about specifications grading, which I recommend. Uh, it's a pretty easy to read and it handles a lot of the, the details and special cases. But this is really about prioritizing the achievement of goals, not, and I keep going back to the weighted average things, but it's also not the distinctions with the granularity of, you know, uh, a thousand point differences between you know, 88.4 and 89.9. It's like, what exactly is the difference between these things and letter grades that fall on the, the boundary? Are we really confident with this? This is a, a perennial problem of please, professor, round up, please, please, please. You just don't have this because I don't personally, maybe you do, but personally, I don't have an internal evaluation metric that is that fine grain. I don't really know what a 72 versus a 74 is. I could make it with a rubric, but then I have to weight the categories of rubrics like style, citation style, organization, uh, you know, content, argumentative structure. It's like, how am I going to weight that? I don't really know. I just kind of make it mathematically convenient for me. Specs grading avoids a lot of those questions that I don't know how to answer. I'll end with just these uh, two bits of feedback. The first is, I love the grading system. I hope it will be applied to courses, all courses for CMU because it made things easier for me. This is a student who did not get an A uh, based on the rest of their um, comment on my FCE. And they still thought it made it better. So that's important to notice. It didn't just make A's more easy. It made it easier to just think about how to learn. And that's what the second comment really puts forward. Amazing course grading system. I wish all courses were built like this as it really forces you to focus on the learning experience instead of the grades. I don't know about you, but that last part, that warms my heart. I feel good when they say, this is about the learning, not the grades, especially in an anonymous format like FCEs. They're not trying to get you know on my good side. At least I don't think so. So I think this is really popular with students. I think it makes more meaningful pedagogical sense. Uh, it's a big change, but I think it's worth it.